Hello, I'm Ben Backwell, CEO of the Global Wind Energy Council. And I'm delighted to join you today to host the virtual launch of the Ocean Renewable Energy Action Coalition's report, The Power of Our Ocean, which outlines a roadmap to the sustainable scale up of ocean-based renewable energy around the world. As we near the anniversary of the Paris Agreement this month, the report outlines a vision for how we can get the world on a trajectory to limit global warming to within 1.5 degrees by harnessing offshore energy and installing 1,400 gigawatts of offshore wind globally by 2050. That's 1,400 gigawatts. Today's report launch marks ORIAC's response to the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy and its findings, which were released yesterday. We'll be speaking shortly with two members of the ORIAC coalition on what the new report contains, and we'll also be joined by representatives of different governments that are committing to offshore wind. First, to provide some scene-setting remarks, we are privileged to have with us a member of the Ocean Panel, Ambassador Peter Thompson, UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, as well as Mr. Gonzalo Munoz, the COP25 high-level climate action champion, nominated to this role by Chile, which also serves as a member of the Ocean Panel. I will hand the floor first to Ambassador Peter Thompson for his remarks. Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings to all who are attending this meeting gathered here today in cyberspace. Only a few decades ago to entertain such a mode of meeting on a subject of such great importance to the future of humanity would have been pipe dreaming. And yet here we are. Such is the power of human innovation and our ability to adapt in the face of necessity. Necessity comes to us these days in the form of a million animal and plant species on the verge of extinction, in a knowledge that the health of the ocean is caught in a spiral of decline, with our planet on course for over three degrees Celsius global warming before the end of this century, with commensurate escalation and devastation of natural disasters. Necessity means we're going to innovate and adapt in so many inspiring ways between now and 2050 and on that blue-green recovery road from the findings of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy to those of the OECD, from the World Economic Forum to the IEA and many others more, we see affirmation of offshore wind energy as a champion in the race to a carbon neutral world by 2050. Closely twinned to this surge in offshore wind energy, comprehensive marine spatial planning of every national exclusive economic zone is required so that science and marine and coastal ecosystems are given due respect, so that local authorities are fully consulted, and so that investors in offshore renewable energy have clear guidelines to work within. And so saying, I add my voice to those calling upon governments to now commit to offshore renewable energy in order to make the smartest choice for the development of a sustainable ocean-based economy. I'm delighted to participate in today's launch of ORIAC's report, The Power of Our Ocean. I applaud ORIAC's global vision of building 1,400 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050 in order to maintain a global warming pathway well below 2 degrees Celsius and of every region of the world having a thriving and sustainable ocean renewable energy industry. For people, planet and prosperity, for a sustainable future for all on planet Earth, the harnessing of offshore renewable energy provides a smart, clean, eminently achievable solution. Let us take the current while it serves. Thank you. Many thanks, Ambassador Thompson, for these inspiring words on the power of human innovation and this achievable solution. I will now hand the floor to Gonzalo Munoz for his remarks. Yes. As the high-level climate action champion for COP25 under the UNFCCC, I welcome the new report, The Power of Oceans, launched today by the Ocean Renewable Energy Action Coalition. This report delivers the message that ocean-based renewable energy, like offshore wind, must be dramatically scaled up around the world in order to achieve Paris compliance scenarios which limit global warming to within 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels. 
It also issues a call to action to governments and non-state actors worldwide to work together for this goal. As we round the corner into 2021 and towards the COP26 summit ahead, we're seeing increasing momentum from non-state actors to accelerate the shift to a decarbonized economy and embrace sustainability as a core tenant of growth. This momentum can be seen through the Race to Zero campaign, which unites members under the same overarching goal, achieving net zero emissions by 2050 at the very latest. So oceans have a role to play in the Race to Zero, definitely. Policymakers can commit to science-based sustainable use of ocean resources, and businesses can scale up ocean-based renewable energy production. We know the ocean is the source of life on Earth and its loss of biodiversity by different industrial activities, mainly related to its fishery, is not only detrimental for life in the ocean itself, but also for the capacity to help us solve climate change. So as part of the COP26, uh, COP25 team, the Blue COP, and coming from Chile, one of the members of the high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy, I can see the potential for ocean-based renewable energy as a response to, clim to climate change in my country, regions, and everywhere across, across the, the world. So I'm delighted to see multiple stakeholders from industry to NGOs collaborating through OREC for this shared vision to scale up offshore wind and other forms of ocean-based renewable energy. The coalition has put forth a bold but achievable vision of 1400 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050, which can deliver a variety of economic and environmental benefits, from green jobs to cleaner air. I encourage governments to explore and commit to offshore wind as part of the road to COP26 next year. The report highlights the steps to build a sustainable and thriving ocean renewable sector, from stable policies to strong cooperation between industry and government. I hope that its vision and findings add to the support for energy system transformation and green recovery, which we are now seeing worldwide, and that governments and non-state actors across uh, can recognize the potential for environmental conservation and economic prosperity to go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Munoz, for your opening remarks, which emphasize the importance of collaboration and global efforts to meet our decarbonization goals. I'm now joined by the two co-leads of the ORIAC Coalition to tell us a little bit more about the report and the work of the coalition itself. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Stephen Bull, Senior Vice President for Offshore Wind at Equinor, and Mr. Ben Sykes, Head of Market Development, Consenting and External Affairs at Orsted. Afternoon, uh, Stephen and Ben, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. It's great to be uh, speaking to you today. Good to see you, Ben. Now, I'm going to start with you, Ben. So wh what is ORIAC and what is your vision for 1,400 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050? Thanks, Ben. So the ORIAC is, it stands for the Offshore Renewable Energy Action Coalition. Um, it's an initiative which was uh, pulled together by Steve and Stephen and myself um, last year, in fact, bringing together major parts of the offshore wind and offshore renewables industry uh, in response to the 2019 call for ocean-based climate action by the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, or the, the, the ocean panel as it's known, uh, which is the 14 heads of state that have been driving this agenda. Uh, so we've got uh, developers like Equinor and Austin, the companies that Stephen and I work for. We've got uh, a lot of other organisations in the supply chain, organisations such as yours, Ben, with GWEC and also others right across the world. So it's a global coalition of industry looking at how we can take action to deliver the ambitions of the high level panel. Uh, our 1400 terawatts of ocean based renewable energy uh, by 2050 we believe that can be achieved from offshore wind. That's a very ambitious target. Uh, that would mean that the oceans were supplying something like 10% of the world's electricity 
and saving over 3 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide annually in terms of emissions. So a huge impact, very important part of getting to net zero and tackling climate change. And what we've seen is that every region in the world can have a thriving, sustainable ocean renewable energy industry. Um, 1,400 gigawatts is a big number. We're only at around 32, 33 gigawatts in the, in the world today. And it's also ambitious when we look at other scenarios. If we look at the International Energy Agency's world outlook, um, they've got something like 570 gigawatts by 2040. So uh, that would be getting us to around 1,000 gigawatts, one terawatt. We think we can go further by 2050. And IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, has also got a one terawatt ambition. So we are being very ambitious here with 1,400 gigawatts, 1.4 terawatts, but we do believe it's achievable. And our report is all about how that can happen. Thanks, Bench. So indeed, 1,400 gigawatts is a very ambitious number, but uh, I think your experience, uh, you know, Bench in, in Europe and the UK shows, you know, what kind of progress can be made if the right steps are taken. Now, in order to provide a, a roadmap to achieve this vision, ORIAC published the report uh, yesterday called uh, The Power of Our Ocean in response to the Ocean Panel report. And Stephen, there's a growing body of literature and a, and a kind of rising ambition around offshore wind, but what's unique about this report? Thanks, Ben. I suppose what's different about this one is that we're bringing the collective industry experience and knowledge to provide this global perspective for offshore wind, and in particular defining the key building blocks for delivering a global industry in new markets, especially. And if you think about it, often we're, we're asked by industry and also policymakers, you know, what are the key questions that we need to ask in terms of actually developing this business across the world? And we can highlight the benefits of this, and particularly for new markets and, and specifically considerations that require attention. So our, our vision really clearly is to develop this industry at a sustainable level and also to try and deploy the capacity needed to meet our vision. As Ben has, out, ben has outlined, we recommend a series of five fundamental building blocks. And these are really important ones because what we're looking for is a stable policy framework. We're looking for a visible pipeline for project deployment, uh, properly resourced institutions, a supportive and engaged public, and then finally, a competitive environment. And as we develop the ocean economy, we'll see that marine spatial planning and effective management of sea users will also be increasingly important too. So we also do discuss this in our report and also with many examples across the world. The final point to make also is that the importance of safety and sustainability and actually how to manage impacts to the environment from offshore wind as well. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So it's, it's, it's bringing it all together, um, I guess, is one of the important aspects of this report and, and, and really linking um, our offshore wind industry to the kind of wider um, uh, questions around ocean uh, sustainability as well, which I, I, I think is really, really fascinating. Um, going back to you, Benj, um, beyond the broader decarbonisation effects of offshore wind that, that make it important in itself, um, how does ocean-based renewable energy contribute to um, economic recovery, particularly in the wake of the pandemic um, and COVID-19? It's such an important question, Ben. And of course, um, people across the world have been so badly affected by the impact of this, this dreadful pandemic. And uh, the, green in, the green recovery is, is more than just words. It is very much uh, a sustainable pathway out of uh, the economic and social difficulties that the, the pandemic has created. So our report, which is in response to the Ocean Panels report, Transformations for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. Um, what it highlights is that by government and industry working together, we can not only unlock the low carbon benefits, as you've mentioned, uh, uh, from offshore renewables, and I talked about the billions of car uh, tons of CO2 every year that can be uh, abated through these technologies, but it's also going to generate jobs, it's going to boost economic growth, and it's going to enable us to tackle climate change at the same time as building strong uh, coastal and other economies uh, around the world. We've seen this in the markets where offshore wind is already thriving. We know that offshore wind and other ocean renewable technologies do transform communities. They bring high quality, sustainable jobs. And we know that there will be hundreds of thousands of jobs around the world on the back of this 1,400 gigawatts that we've been talking about. Uh, so it's not only good for 
the environment. It's not only good for climate change, it's great for economies. It also produces much cleaner air. It enables us to have high air quality. So there's a whole range of reasons why um, ocean renewable energy is such an important part of um, our future, both out of the COVID pandemic, but also tackling climate change. Yeah, thanks, Vince. And uh, finally, Stephen, how can countries um, use this report for nurturing their own offshore wind sectors? And, and how will Oriac be playing a part um, in, in, in helping company, uh, countries to step up? Well, there, Ben, as we all agree on, there's no time to lose in tackling climate change. And it's important that we can take action now, but also give politicians and policymakers a, and a chance to actually forward a vision and direction so what our report does, it, it presents case studies of how different countries have approached their delivery of an offshore wind industry. And we hope this is really important information for policymakers to actually create their own conditions for their own market. Now, obviously, one size doesn't fit all here. We have many different variations of offshore wind uh, policy frameworks within Europe, but also that we've actually hoped that the building blocks, the five building blocks I mentioned, serve as the, the guiding principles for countries looking to establish or grow their offshore wind markets. Also, the report highlights some of the, the need for collaboration between industry, government, key stakeholders as well, and also ensure sustainable deployment of offshore wind and other ocean renewable energy technologies. So it's also part of the coalition's activities. GWEC and WRI have been engaging with governments across the world where they can also support on scaling up their offshore wind markets, as well as publishing important resources such as this report, which is Ben just mentioned, and also particularly a market readiness assessment toolkit. Now, we really hope that these resources can be used in the future and inspire new markets to initiate the conversation on what is needed to develop a truly global offshore wind industry. Great. Thank you, Stephen. And I mean, from my point of view, it's great having both of you as, as champions for this uh, initiative, particularly because you're both from companies that are kind of, you know, actually walking the walk and and you know, the cutting edge of, of, of making this happen um, around the world. So it's been good talking to you both. Um, I look forward to working with you. And, and um, for those of you watching, please reach out, um, have a look at the report and uh, reach out to ORIAC um, and see how you can get involved. Um, thanks guys for, for taking part today. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you, Ben. Now, a big part of ORIAC's work has been to raise awareness of sustainable ocean-based renewable energy and work with governments around the world to realize their own offshore wind and other ocean energy potentials. We're joined today by a few government representatives who will be sharing their own statements of support and vision for offshore wind. I'll hand the floor first to Mr. Tiago Ferreira, the president of EPE, the Energy Research Office of Brazil, for his remarks. Tiago, welcome. Hello, I'm Tiago Bajau, Executive President of EPE, the Federal Office for Energy Planning Studies in Brazil. Throughout 2019, EPE developed a first roadmap for offshore wind in Brazil. This roadmap aimed at addressing the main challenges and opportunities for offshore wind development in the national context. This work benefited from close collaboration with many relevant public stakeholders, such as the Federal Environmental Agency, the Electricity Regulator, the Ministry of Mines and Energy, and the Brazilian Navy. We also had valuable contribution from the private sector, and we had support from different multilateral agencies, helping us understand the main features of this technology which is still unprecedented in Brazil. With this effort, it is possible to affirm that the Brazilian potential is huge. Along its coast, Brazil has 700 gigawatt of offshore wind potential. Meanwhile, we have now seven different offshore wind farms at their initial development stage, having required environmental licensing. This proves that offshore wind is gaining momentum and we must address regulatory and market gaps as this technology gains competitiveness worldwide. We must be aware that adequate ports, infrastructure and logistics will be key as well. And we believe it's possible to take advantage of synergies 
with oil and gas industry and expertise. Looking ahead, it's time to make regulatory framework more friendly to entrepreneurs so that offshore wind can find a place in a growing and more competitive market for renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago. And we at GWEC and ORIAC are incredibly excited about the nascent but tremendous offshore wind opportunity in Brazil. Next, I'd like to hand the floor to Mr. Carl John, Renewable Energy Specialist from the UK's Department for International Trade, who will tell us how the UK, as the world's currently biggest offshore wind market, is accelerating sector growth. Carl. Good morning. My name is Carl John. I work for the Department for International Trade. We're the department looking to attract foreign direct investors into the UK, but at the same time ensuring companies who operate in the UK have a route to export their goods and services to the rest of the world. I've been asked to give you a whistle-stop tour of offshore wind in the UK. The operational fleet in the UK is currently at 10 gigawatts. We are in the process of constructing four gigawatts as we speak, and the later CFD round brought forward 5.5 gigawatts to be built by 2025. By 2025, the operational fleet in the UK will be around 20 gigawatts. On the 6th of October, the Prime Minister announced an increasing increase of the ambition of 30 gigawatts by 2030 to one of 40 gigawatts. In addition, adding one gigawatt of floating offshore wind. This means in the latter half of the decade, we will need to install 20 gigawatts at an annual run rate of around about four gigawatts. Now, the 2050 context is also very important. The UK government has signed legally binding net zero um, carbon targets. And this means that we need to tackle decarbonisation of the heating and the transport network. And electricity will play one will play a crucial role one way or the other, whether it's directly into batteries or using the hydrogen economy. The UK government will shortly be releasing a white paper which will outline the direction of travel of this technology going forward. But I think one thing that is very clear currently is that offshore wind will play a major role going forward. Thank you, Carl. We are getting close to the end of our launch event today, so I want to thank all of our speakers again for joining us and for sharing their support and vision for how offshore wind and other forms of ocean-based renewable energy can play a critical role in decarbonizing the 
the planet. We've had a view into different markets and development across the sector, and we've also had strong messages and guidance uh, from this report from ORIAC, which can help other governments and stakeholders work together to achieve this 1,400 gigawatt uh, vision by 2050. I encourage everyone watching to download the report on the ORIAC page, which can be found uh, on the GWEC website, and join us on this journey to create thriving, prosperous, and sustainable ocean-based economies in the decades to come. Don't forget to join us this afternoon for another exciting session on Asia's emerging offshore wind markets to find out about how Asia will play an increasingly important role in driving the offshore wind growth that we anticipate in this report globally. Thank you very much.